Welcome to the first session uh, this year of the Rock Center Student Lunch Series. I'm Amanda Packle from the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. We've undertaken an effort to host more of these student lunch events um, and to get more students interested in the topic of corporate governance. And we've been doing that by featuring uh, some of the issues that have been covered in the news. And today we have one covered not just extensively in the Wall Street Journal, but also recently in Vanity Fair. Um, and we're also doing that by trying to feature other law school faculty uh, who specialize in other more obviously interesting areas of law than corporate governance. So today we've invited Professor Michelle Mello, who's a professor of law here and a professor of health research and policy over at the School of Medicine, uh, to join Professor Joe Grunfest, a professor of law and business and senior faculty here at the Rock Center, to discuss um, the meltdown of former Silicon Valley darling Theranos and uh, Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Joe and Michelle. Michelle, why don't you hit it off? All right. Thanks. Well, our story today is about the rise and fall of the so-called unicorn, one of those mythical privately held startups that attain a net worth over a billion dollars. And as much as anything else, I think it's a cautionary tale about the dangers of dropping out of Stanford before you get your degree. So take heed. So our story begins, uh, and I'll, I'll credit here NPR for this wonderful slide deck that I'll show here. Our story begins with uh, Elizabeth Holmes, who's an undergrad here at Stanford, and decides to leave after her sophomore year to found her own biomedical engineering company. Uh, the company rapidly rises to prominence on the promise of delivering a technology that can screen patients for dozens of biomarkers and health conditions at one time using just a drop of blood obtained from a fingerprint. It calls its technology the Edison machine and the collection containers for the blood nanotainers. And the vision here, as she articulated in a now famous TED talk, is a future in which patients are routinely screening themselves or sometimes in partnership with their physician getting screened for scores of conditions long before they present any symptoms, and they have access to these tests at a very low cost um, and potentially without having to involve a medical provider at all. You get it when you go into a Safeway or a Walgreens, as the case turned out to be. So the, there were several things about the technology that made it a real game changer in the $53 billion a year diagnostics industry, which is dominated by a couple of large players and characterized by very high costs. So one of them is the speed of the testing. As any of you who have been a patient know, uh, typically you get a test result through your physician's office. You may have to go to a different facility to get that test. You may wait days, although it can be done in minutes. You may wait days to get those results, and you may have to go back to your physician to get the results interpreted. So there's a promise of, of rapid turnaround just within hours from this technology. Second is cost. They claimed they could do these tests at less than half what Medicare and Medicaid pay, the major companies for their tests. And they also touted the potential to avoid future health care costs by intervening early in patients who have early signs of disease or are at risk of disease. Uh, the third was the prospect of reduced discomfort for patients, that you don't have to get needles and, and uh, uh, Holmes often asserted that many patients didn't follow through on um, physician orders to get lab tests because of fear of needles. And then the last was the, the direct to consumer uh, prospect of all of this, that we could take the physician out of the equation. Those who don't have easy access to physicians do have easy access to a Walgreens and can go in and get screened whenever they would like. So it was a potential game changer in an industry that was ripe for disruption because the technology was old and it was dominated just by a few uh, players. Uh, very early on, people raised questions about the kinds of claims that Theranos made about its products in terms of whether these um, achievements would be good for society. You know, do we want to take physicians out of testing relationships and leave patients to interpret potentially very distressing results on their own? Um, do we want patients to get routinely screened for all kinds of conditions 
you know, testing is not cost-free either economically or in terms of its burdens on the patient. All tests have false positives and false negatives, which can lead patients down a rabbit hole of further testing and procedures, as well as causing a lot of distress and, in the case of false negatives, um, opportunities to intervene that, that would save people's lives. So lots of questions about whether the technology, even if it worked, would be good. But that's not where the focus of our remarks today is going to be, because the problem was the technology didn't work. And that's what led their us into trouble. So in the early days, the company attracted um, venture capital very easily. Uh, and Holmes herself became a media darling. She was featured. Well, so there's a very different kind of venture capital. And we'll get to that Thank in you. the second half of the story. Thank you. Uh, so at one point, for example, she raises $400 million from a series of investors who effectively value this company at over nine billion dollars. And, and during all this time, the company is operating very much in stealth mode, um, claiming trade secrets. It declines to share information about its technology, either in peer-reviewed journals, as might be customary, or even to share very much with potential investors or potential board members. Now, in 2015, doubts about the company really begin to surface on a wide scale. Here at Stanford, my colleague in the School of Medicine, John Ioannidis, published a commentary in the Journal of American Medical Association questioning the company's reluctance, in fact, refusal to publish any proof of its technology in peer-reviewed journals. Typically, when an innovator is asking the healthcare system to radically upend the way it does things, it offers proof that this new way of doing things um, offers benefits for patients or for payers, and, and Theranos simply wasn't interested in documenting this in peer-reviewed uh, uh, scientific publications. The company was also criticized for appointing a board of directors that can best be described as celebrities um, with little or no business or medical background. Um, in July 2015, Therano got FDA approval for one of its tests. It didn't have to do that, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, but it did. It was a herpes simplex virus test. Um, and presumably, this is one effort on the part of the company to provide some transparency and, and rigor around its technology in the absence of any scientific publications. Then in October 2015, a Wall Street Journal article by John Kerry Brew blows the lid off this company's business, interviewing several former employees. He reports that the employees had concern about the accuracy of the tests. Um, and that the company was doing, using its Edison machine to carry out the testing on only about 15 out of the 120 or so tests that it was doing. The rest uh, it was just using conventional equipment for, and there were charges that it was actually diluting blood samples in order to get enough volume to do those tests, which jeopardizes the accuracy of the tests. Uh, so this is a major expose. And shortly afterward come the regulators. In October of that year, the FDA says it has concerns about these nanotainers, these small blood vials, uh, says that it's inclined to think about these as medical devices, which would place it within the realm of the agency's regulatory authority. And it leans on Theranos to halt their use. Um, the FDA then reports that it finds sh large shortcomings in the tests themselves and orders Theranos to stop using its Edison machine to do these tests, except for the one test that has FDA approval. Then uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services comes on the scene. It's implicated because Theranos uses clinical laboratories, and all clinical laboratories are subject to CMS oversight through a statute called CLIA, as I'll talk about in just a second. So uh, there's a CLIA inspection, um, which should happen routinely, but the results are anything but routine. Um, CMS finds scores of quality regulations. It issues a 121-page report detailing all these violations in March of 2016, and the company scrambles to get back into compliance. Shortly thereafter, there does emerge the first peer-reviewed journal article about the technology, but it's not from Theranos. It's from a group of academic investigators who've had people get blood samples tested at uh, a retail outlet in Arizona where that's featuring Theranos testing, and then it has compared them to conventional uh, laboratory tests and equipment and finds large and pervasive discrepancies in the results. So despite Theranos' considerable efforts to clean up its act, CMS is not impressed. Uh, it continues to find the company to be out of compliance. And in July, it bans Ms. Holmes from uh, owning or operating any kind of 
diagnostic testing facility for two years and imposes a number of other sanctions on the company, as you see here, including a ban on getting any payment from Medicare and Medicaid, which is a death knell for any company in the healthcare space, since that they are a, a very large payer in the United States. Just before this, the company discloses that the Justice Department and the SEC have also begun initiating it over alleged failures to make accurate disclosures to investors and others. And in May, the company makes the decision to void over two years of its Edison test data and send out corrected reports to patients. And then, as you probably heard, just within the last couple of weeks, Holmes has announced a pivot. Uh, Silicon Valley speak, I think, for uh, throwing in the towel with regard to the Edison machine and the original technology, announces that the company is going to close all of its clinical labs, lay off nearly half of its workforce, and focus on developing what she calls the mini lab, which is another technology that would deliver a lot of test results with low blood volume, but is considered by experts to be not nearly as revolutionary as Edison. So that's where things stand now with the company. Uh, to put this all in context, let me say just a little bit about the broader regulatory environment. This, this is really added to a longstanding controversy about how to develop, how to regulate so-called laboratory developed tests, or LDTs. These are um, diagnostic tests that are developed and used within a single laboratory, as opposed to a commercial test kit that would be sent out for use in a wide variety of laboratories. Um, historically, these have been tests developed at academic medical centers and elsewhere that are um, conducted and interpreted by very highly trained, very highly specialized experts. But with the advent of genetic uh, testing companies like 23andMe and now Theranos, we're really in a new world of new kinds of LDTs, and that's really raised a lot of questions about how we should go about regulating them. Um, the, regular, uh, the regulatory environment is dominated by two uh, major players, but in the case of Theranos, it got a lot more complicated. So the main way that we regulate LDTs right now is through a statute called CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvements Act of 1988, which gives CMS, again, our Medicare and Medicaid agency, the responsibility to inspect and accredit clinical labs. And this inspection you can think of as kind of like a driver's license to conduct particular tests. It's not focused on whether a test is clinically valid, meaning that the thing that it looks for actually predicts disease. And it's not focused on clinical utility, meaning that the test actually makes outcomes better for patients. But just at the analytical validity of the test, does it in fact detect what it's supposed to detect? And then more broadly, at a bunch of quality control measures within the labs, focusing on the training of the personnel and the facilities and so forth. So um, that's been, relatively uh, speaking, a very light regulatory touch, and that's been primarily the ways in which LDTs have been regulated. Um, FDA, though, over the last 10 years has begun to take the position that it should be more involved in this area of regulation. So it actually has authority to regulate LDTs because under the, the F uh, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, they meet the definition of a medical device, and specifically an in vitro diagnostic device. So it could be doing more. Historically, it has hung back and allowed uh, regulation just through CLIA. But now, as the complexity and risks associated with these kinds of tests have increased, um, FDA has begun to take the position that it should be doing more exercising its regulatory discretion to, to require companies to undergo the same kinds of testing and proof that other makers of medical devices have to do, which do focus on the clinical utility and the validity of the device, and which typically require large clinical trials in order to establish. So starting with 23andMe, uh, where the FDA really moved to limit the company's discretion, there's been a lot more um, effort for it to enter this space. Um, not clear where it's all going to shake out. There's been legislation introduced in the Congress to clarify matters, but it's still very much in flux. In part because there's a bit of a regulatory vacuum in the absence of stronger FDA regulation, there's been a particularly robust roles for other forms of regulation, as we've seen with Theranos. The Department of Justice can bring criminal actions and, and has begun moving along those lines for companies that allegedly misrepresent to consumers what they're doing. SEC, of course, can investigate companies who allegedly make misleading disclosures um, in their investment statements. Um, and then finally, there's a role for private litigation here and for peer review. Peer review is the scientific process of evaluating scientific work that is um, submitted for journal publication, and it's an important form of private regulation in science, having other experts review what is done. 
Um, and then private litigation uh, it, it has begun to blossom, as Joe will talk about uh, just in just a second, in Theranos' cases from both investors and from injured uh, persons. I've seen a number of my torch students in the audience, and there are, they should know that there are a number of private suits, some which have been brought as class actions, alleging harms associated from inaccurate testing results. For example, the need for additional tests, um, or emotional distress, or in one case, the lost opportunity because of a false negative to prevent a heart attack. So there is a blossoming now of regulation in the space of all kinds, but the most interesting development of the last week has been the announcement that one of the hedge funds that has invested in the company is suing now uh, for alleged uh, misleading statements. So I'll turn it over to Joe to talk about that. Thank you, Professor Mello. And as Professor Mello pointed out at the beginning, this should be a very powerful moral message to everybody in this room. Do not drop out of Stanford as a sophomore because in your junior year, we teach you how to avoid all of this stuff, you see? So wait till you're done with your junior year, then drop out, okay? Because sophomore, big mistake. Um, so all of the stuff that Professor Mello talked about really is a predicate to what I describe as a litigation storm. When you have litigation in many companies, it's common to find situations where it's not just one lawsuit. Rather, it's a three-ring circus, a five-ring circus, a seven-ring circus. And the challenge that faces the company is being able to handle all of the litigation going on in all of these different venues all at the same time, maintain a consistent defense strategy, and optimize your response to all of these different challenges. So now let's look at all of the different venues that this company is dealing with. Well, first and most important, you've got the United States Department of Justice. You want to pay attention to them because you piss them off adequately. What happens? Anybody? You go to jail. OK? All right, so generally, you want to pay attention. So you know that you've got one set of actors involved that can deprive you of your liberty. You may then, in addition, have additional state criminal exposure. There isn't anything public of which I'm aware. But when the feds are involved, you often get follow along state actions. So you're going to want to pay attention to whether the attorney general in California is thinking that you violated some California laws or somebody in Arizona or what have you. They have jails in the state system too, all right? Don't forget that. Meanwhile, you've got all of these different customers. The customers are also pissed. Wait a minute. I paid you money or my insurance company paid you money. I got test results that are lousy. Plus, I suffered all of these different personal damages as a result of these lousy tests. Not enough that you've antagonized the federal government at the Department of Justice and you've antagonized your customers. You've also antagonized investors because you've got investors that have now come forward and we'll spend a little bit more time talking about this and have said, wait a minute, I put $100 million into this company. I did it on the basis of certain representations you made to me. These representations turned out to be false. What's a common word for a representation that turns out to be false? Lie. You lied to me. OK? So you lied to me, and it's going to cost me $100 million, because if you would have told me the truth, then I never would have put the money in the company. And last, you have the United States Securities and Exchange Commission involved. And it's really very interesting when the SEC gets involved, because they have an ability to litigate claims of fraud much more aggressively than the private party litigants can, which means the SEC can win an action against a company where in many situations the private party, the investor, would never be able to win that claim. Putting all of this together, there are, I think, very significant implications, not just for Theranos, but for all of Silicon Valley. And there's one company where it's already publicly known that the SEC is looking at them also, and that's a company called Zenefits. All right, and some of you may have read some stuff about that. If we get around to that, we can talk about it as well. So let's talk a little bit about implications for Silicon Valley and why the situation with Theranos is really about much more than Theranos. If you have a look at the investors in Theranos, the first thing that you'll notice is that none of the brand name venture capital firms that typically invest in unicorn companies appear in this situation. And we know from third party reporting that Elizabeth Holmes did try to get big brand name venture capital firms involved, and none of them would invest a nickel in this company. Anybody want to speculate as to why that might be? Anybody, take a shot. Due diligence. Due diligence. 
What about the due diligence? You got that's basically it. She wasn't willing to provide it. She was lip flapping, all right, and and you know situations where the VC firms would come in and say, well, all right, let's see the clinical results. You don't want to publish it, at least show it to us. She would claim, no, trade secret information. I can't share that information with you. To which the VCs look at her and go, great, you can't share that information with us. We can't share our money with you. All right, it's share and share alike. So you know, no deal under those circumstances. Now, when the SEC comes in and looks at a situation where the SEC thinks that there's been fraud in the sale of a security, the interesting thing to recognize is that the way the federal securities laws are written, a private party suing the company and saying, I got to get my money back, has to demonstrate something called reliance, meaning that you told me a lie, all right, you've got to demonstrate the material misrepresentation or omission, you told me the lie, and I relied on the lie. Okay? The SEC, when it sues, doesn't have to demonstrate reliance. The law allows the SEC to bring an action, and even if no investor ever relied on the lie, the simple fact that there's a lie allows the SEC to proceed. Under most causes of action available to private parties, the private party under the federal securities law has to demonstrate something known as scienter. Scienter is defined as a state of mind embracing an intent to deceive, all right? That you must have told the lie and you really intended to fool me. Well, what's interesting is the federal securities laws have provisions that allow the SEC to come in and to sue based on negligence. So even if the company didn't intend to tell the lie, if the company simply failed to exercise the appropriate standard of care and knew or should have known that the statement that it was making was false, the SEC can come in and sue and prevail in that kind of a situation. A private party also has to demonstrate loss causation, that the material misrepresentation that was made with Santer upon which I relied actually caused a loss. The SEC does not have to demonstrate loss causation. So if you simply take the information that we know about in the public domain, it's very easy to reach the conclusion that the SEC has a wonderful slam-bang easy layup case against Theranos, the company, and against the individuals at the company who made the alleged misrepresentations to demonstrate that they actually violated the federal securities laws. Now the interesting question then arises, what's the implication of that? And here I think the negotiations between the SEC and the company are going to be extraordinarily interesting. The SEC can actually wind up suing the company or can sue the individuals. Suppose the SEC decides to sue the company and decides to penalize the company. I'm just going to make up a number and say you should pay a penalty of $100 million. Well, whom does that penalty hurt if it's paid by the company? Sorry? Shareholders. The shareholders. But wait a minute. Who was damaged by the fraud? So how is this helping the shareholders? All right. No, wait a minute. So, so right away you sort of say, hey, wait a minute. What's going on over here? We, the shareholders, paid more for the stock than we should have because the company lied to us. Now you're going to penalize the company by saying it's got to pay $100 million. All right. Well, the $100 million is only going to reduce the value of the stock, which is already higher than it should have been. So you can imagine the investors saying to the SEC, when it comes to this litigation, you're not exactly doing us a favor by penalizing the company. Who is it, whom is it, that could be penalized without actually hurting the investors? The executives, the individuals. And this brings out one of the biggest public policy issues that the federal government faces, whether it's the SEC, the Department of Justice, <laughs> FDA, or what have you. When you're going after an organization, what you have to recognize is a certain sense in which a corporation has, has, has you know, no body to kick it, has no soul to damn. It's an artificial creation of the state. And when you wind up imposing a penalty, 
the penalty in many ways winds up being visited upon the equity holders or the other creditors or other beneficiaries of the corporation. Now, there's a theory that says as you penalize the corporation, it gives the corporation incentives to, to engage in better precautionary activities and to make sure that conduct of this sort doesn't occur again in the future. And it's a perfectly legitimate theory, but it's also perfectly legitimate to point out that in some situations you come in and you penalize the corporation, what you're really doing is doubling up on the victimization of the people that are actually harmed by the fraud. The situation is going to get even more interesting. In many situations, you have contracts that contain a provision that's known as a big boy provision. Right? It's a little gender specific, but that's what it's been called for decades. And it's also known as a non-reliance provision. In a non-reliance provision or a big boy provision, a corporation in effect says, look, our liabilities and our responsibility with regard to representations are limited to the representations that are contained in the four corners of this document. If we gave you an oral presentation, or if we gave you a PowerPoint presentation, and if it's not included or referenced into in this document, and that oral presentation or that PowerPoint presentation contains lies, you can't sue us. You can't rely on it. You've got to do your own due diligence. All right? We're all big boys at this table. The only thing that we're going to accept responsibility for are the representations that are specifically referenced in this document. Now, given the way Theranos did business, and I should be clear, this is pure speculation on my part, I wouldn't be surprised if any investment agreement contains within it a pretty aggressive big boy provision all right, that says, look, you can't sue us except based on the misrepresentations that we made. And the law surrounding big boy provisions differs jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And there's situational differences that might arise. And one of the things that I'd be looking at in this, in this litigation that's filed by the Partners Fund, that put in $100 million into Theranos and appears to have lost all of it, um, is what was the documentation like? What does that big boy provision look like? Was there one? Uh, and if so, how will the court in Delaware, in particular, interpret this provision, given the fact that Delaware courts have in the past enforced big boy provisions uh, under the law? So that'll be a very interesting issue. And the last point that I want to make is I've talked to a whole bunch of very experienced and senior venture capitalists in Silicon Valley about this case, and I've really been quite surprised very few of them are aware of the extent to which the Securities and Exchange Commission can bring a cause of action simply based on negligence. Most venture capitalists, for perfectly understandable reasons, have been conditioned by private party litigation. And that's understandable because we here in Silicon Valley have run this community for more than 30 years and there's really never been any material SEC enforcement action in Silicon Valley. The community has been largely self-policing, and instances in which people think that there really is outright fraud have been extraordinarily rare. The confluence of the Theranos situation, the Zenefit situation, and a couple of other situations in effect suggests that the SEC is going to view itself as having reason to set up camp in Silicon Valley to police claims of misrepresentations that are made in these transactions that typically involve very high-risk situations and very sophisticated investors, and then to expose corporations and their investors to the additional risks of having the SEC as another party at the table. And in all of these situations, by the way, it's trivially easy to run up a $10 million attorney fee, all right, Bill, simply defending your company and handling all of the investigative stuff that goes on when the SEC shows up at your door, not to mention when the Justice Department shows up. All right? Legal fees at Theranos, boom. Okay? Uh, and I guarantee you that in none of their annual budgets that they presented to the board of directors they did it have a line item that says, defending the company indemnification agreements in criminal prosecution, $50 million. 
That was not budgeted for, uh, but that's an expense that they're going to be incurring now. Question Mello? Well, can I start the questioning? Go for it. Okay, great. So I'm wondering, as a matter of justice, why, if at all, are these investors entitled to compensation? I mean, they accepted this investment without doing due diligence. If you buy a nicely wrapped box without looking what's inside, aren't you accepting the risk that it's just a piece of junk in there? You know, um, I think that's an argument that Theranos is certainly making. All right. It's making it in the private litigation saying, hey, look, you know, we said a whole bunch of stuff, but if there's this non-reliance provision, you can't sue us on that. All right. So we were nasty people. OK, so we lied to you. But you signed an agreement that basically waives any ability to recover anything from us. And then when you go into the SEC, you make the same argument. You sort of say, hey, wait a minute. We, how can you hold us responsible for a situation where there's a non-reliance provision? These people agreed to invest anyway. We understand that as a technical matter, the elements of the cause of action in an SEC uh, prosecution doesn't require that the SEC show reliance. But as a matter of public policy, you shouldn't go forward. You know how effective that's going to be with the SEC? Well, maybe not very effective, but I guess it's going to go nowhere. if I can get like a little more Socratic on you, because you didn't go really answer it. my question. As a matter I've been, I've been of justice. Watching, I've been watching too many presidential debates. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They're chopping off heads. They're drowning right. people in cages. Why are we even talking about this? No, as a matter of justice, do you, do you think the government has any business regulating here? Or is it just, you know, if they yes. want to send, send stupid money around the valley, that's, that's their business? Nope. I think the government has a positive social function it can perform, particularly if it, 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 it goes after the individuals who are responsible for this wrongdoing. If the information in the press is half correct, these people knew that they were lying, they were telling massive lies, that they were building a $9 billion uh, market capitalization uh, based on fantasies that simply were not there. That's not socially beneficial conduct. Uh, it generates terrible externalities. And I have zero problems going after the individuals that are responsible for that wrongdoing. And if there really is a non-reliance provision in the agreement, then the individual investors won't have an ability effectively to punish the people who lie to them. Lies are corrosive. I think lies are particularly corrosive here in Silicon Valley where investors, you know, we take enough risk as it is when people tell us the truth. All right, comes, yeah, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build a social network and it's gonna be worth $100 billion. Yeah, right, okay. Um, uh, taking out of the equation the possibility that somebody is shining you on and simply fabricating stuff, I think is a great social value for this community. Uh, and, and what we need to do is find the right balance. And it'll be an interesting question to see whether the Department of Justice, the SEC, and all of the other enforcement agencies are able to strike that balance. So shall we open it up? Yeah. And, um, Amanda, do you want people to use the mics? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Don't let that deter you. Come on up. <laughs> yes, please. So I was wondering regarding the agreements with uh, Larry. Can the validity be if someone is convicted the validity of that document and the lawyers be sued as well? Um, all right. So can somebody challenge the validity of the document if it's got the, the non-reliance provision? Well, experienced lawyers know how to negotiate non-reliance provisions, and courts will typically enforce non-reliance provisions only as against sophisticated counterparties. All right? And in this situation where we know you've got the partners fund, that's an investor, they're probably a pretty sophisticated counterparty. So, so if there is a non-reliance provision, there's going to be some interesting litigation that's going to have to go on uh, in order to get the court persuaded that this is one of those unusual circumstances where you sh in which you shouldn't enforce a non-reliance provision against a sophisticated party. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very interested to see. The complaint is still under seal. Uh, I, I 
be very interested to see what the complaint says, and I'd be very interested to see what Theranos' defense is. But, uh, sure Step to the microphone, because otherwise our director is going to be very unhappy. <laughs> but I, I'm sure there is a line where the lawyer's activity itself becomes something like a fraud. If he was in the inside circle, he knew what the whole thing, what was going on, then I think validity, it would be easy validity-wise and individual claims against the lawyer himself. Well, that's, that, you're raising a very interesting question there. Did the lawyers themselves know that Elizabeth Holmes, hypothetically, was actually committing a fraud? And were they then participating in the fraud? Now, I would be very surprised if that turns out to be the case. My bet would be that Elizabeth Holmes' approach to the lawyers was pretty much the same as her approach to everyone else. I'm not telling you that, all right, because that's trade secret information and you don't need to know. Right? And we don't want any of that information to leak. And meanwhile, the trade secret was, this stuff doesn't work. Okay? You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit like Richard Nixon's plan for getting us out of Vietnam. Okay? He didn't have a plan. All right? That was his trade secret, but he won the election. All right? This appears to be Elizabeth Holmes' business model, too. Tell people you've got a plan, raise the capital, all right? but at some point it becomes pretty obvious to people that you haven't got it. So you're raising... Great questions. Ex ante probability, I would hope, is low that any lawyers were involved in it. But if lawyers were, yeah, then they're potentially exposed. I have two questions. The first is just a clarifying one. You said that the particularities of this case were different because of the way that Theranos raised its funding. Is that because the people that bought equity in Theranos joined the board? and? It gets into this. Well, so let me answer. So first, it's very common for people who provide capital in Silicon Valley also to join the board. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the board of directors of the vast majority of Silicon Valley companies, you're going to have several venture capitalists on the board. And in fact, many companies, many investors won't put their money in unless they also get a board seat, all right, if you're putting enough money into a company. Uh, that's, that's common operating procedure. The thing that's unique about Theranos is that they purportedly got to a $9 billion valuation without any of the big names involved in the company. There's, there's no Sequoia, there's no Benchmark, there's no Andreessen Horowitz, there's no Kleiner Perkins, all right? None of, instead, what you have is you know one fund that came in early because the guy was a family friend of Elizabeth Holmes early on, and then in none of the later rounds do you have traditional Silicon Valley VC money. Why? Due diligence. People would ask sensible questions, and she'd refuse to give answers. My, my second question is whether, or sort of to what extent do you think the headline of all of this is that we need to just treat the healthcare industry differently when it comes to unicorns or sort of big kind of startup venture funding? Yeah, that, that's a question I'd like to think a lot more about. I, I mean, I don't know if I would put the boundary around the healthcare industry, but I would say the public policy considerations in favor of getting involved as a regulator are higher when the product has the potential to cause actual physical harm to people. So there are lots of products that aren't healthcare products that fit that description. Um, but you know the externalities that Joe mentioned seem much higher when you're talking about damage that goes beyond the loss of capital. Um, on the other hand, in the healthcare space, I, I guess the counter argument is we actually have a lot of regulators on the scene already that other industries don't have, and particularly when we're talking about drugs and devices, you know you get into competition potentially between the regulatory scheme that we've set up at FDA and um, lots of less organized, less expert forms of regulation from outside. So, you know, maybe the argument for healthcare products is more regulation, but let's use the agencies that have the expertise so, to do that. So, so just a broader point here. Um, if you have a look at the R&D model in the pharmaceutical sector, it's been radically disrupted over the last 20 or 30 years. It used to be that companies like Pfizer actually had big labs that would find blockbuster drugs. That's not working anymore, right? Most of the major new pharmaceuticals and therapeutics are being found, founded by relatively small startup companies, right, that wind up growing to a size 
and then they wind up being bought out by Big Pharma or licensing to Big Pharma after they've got good uh, phase two clinical trials and a variety of business models. Innovation in the pharmaceutical and healthcare sector is now occurring primarily away from the traditional big pharma models, all right, uh, big pharma firms. We have outsourced creativity in effect to Silicon Valley and to the companies around Boston and what have you. And the successes in this model dramatically outweigh the failures, but we also have to recognize that Theranos is a failure in this space. Uh, and and they're, 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 you know, uh, 23 and me, they had their regulatory issues, all right? Uh, but, you know, uh, by and large, the successes far outweigh the failures. Uh, given the different threats that uh, Theranos is, is facing now uh, externally from, you know, the DOJ, SEC, and this litigation, um, can you speak a little bit more about the dynamics between the investors and the executives now uh, in the boardroom and, you know, if, if they are still aligned oh in any way? Gosh, does the word, let's see, let me pull out my mental thesaurus. Bitter, antagonistic, <laughs> hostile, <laughs> vicious, vituperative, oh, we could go on and on and on. You know, just, just, just like a meeting of Trump's campaign staff. <laughs> um, the, the investors must be absolutely livid and wondering what's the best way to get blood from a stone here. Because as a practical matter, the enterprise value of Theranos is a very small fraction of the $9 billion that they once thought it was. Uh, and even if you bring the lawsuit, and even if this, this, this hedge fund prevails, and it gets a judgment for $100 million, are they going to really wind up with a $100 million judgment against a bankrupt entity? All right? Uh, and, you know, you say, fine, let's take it out of Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes doesn't have $100 million. She's got a lot of stock in Theranos, and that stock may be absolutely worthless. So this may actually turn out to be one of those situations where you don't really get your money back. Now, what happened at Zenefits is, is very interesting, and, very, and it's revealing that it's happened at Zenefits and appears not yet to have happened at Theranos. At Zenefits, the government discovered uh, that, that this company was violating a variety of insurance regulations. The board found out about it. They immediately fired the CEO, and the venture capitalists got together, and they recut the deal. So the companies in Silicon Valley raise capital in stages, Series A, Series B, Series C, Series D. Let's assume Zenefits raised Series D. And let's assume that the price at each round goes up, all right, continually, which is what happens when you have a successful startup. Well, let's suppose that the fraud and the lies occurred between Series C and Series D, all right? What that means is that the Series D investors overpaid, but the series A, B, and C investors did not. So what the investors did at Zenefits, they said, wait a minute, this company has good ongoing value. We can clean this company up, we can fix it. And there's a fascinating article in this morning's New York Times about how they're cleaning up Zenefits and what they're doing to turn that company around. And here's how we're gonna resolve the potential bitterness in the boardroom. The early investors, people who went in on rounds A, B, and C, are now going to give more stock to the later investors, in effect, reducing the price at which they invested. So if the Series D investors came in at what's called a pre-money valuation of $4 billion, the investors sit around the table and say, you know, if you would have told us the truth, we would have valued this company at $2 billion. And the investors all agree, great. You pay twice as much as you should have, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you two shares of stock for every share of stock that you originally got, so you will now have twice as much, and it will be as though you invested at the $2 billion price. The company can then turn to the SEC and say, look, through private ordering, we have addressed the overvaluation and the fraud. Now, you want to go after the individuals? Okay, but please leave us alone. We agree that the later investors paid more than they should have. 
and we've already negotiated a resolution to that. Now let us build the damn company, all right, and not spend money on litigating with the SEC. That's almost certainly what's going on behind the scenes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can I ask a question of clarification about sure. the deep pockets? So you said the SEC suits could proceed on a negligence theory. Yes. Yes. So in that case, would the company's insurance cover the, the damages? Typically, these cases are always settled, mm -hmm. right? And if there's a settlement, uh, the insurance will always pay. The interesting thing is when, when a private party has to demonstrate scienter, because scienter really is fraud, mm -hmm. and there's usually a fraud exception in insurance right. policy, nobody ever wants to litigate the case to the conclusion of fraud, because then the insurance proceeds go away. So the whole structure of the insurance market, in effect, promotes settlements and avoids jury trials where you actually have a finding of real responsibility. And plaintiffs want that as a practical matter as much as defendants do. And so how well insured is the company? And would that potentially be a resolution to the problem that we've talked about? Well, it's very common for non-public Silicon Valley companies to carry no d insurance. So it's very common for there to be no insurance on the table and for you know directors and executives to be covered exclusively by indemnification agreements. Okay. So that means that here there's no third party to tap for these recoveries. Mr. Baker, Hi. welcome back. How's it going? Um, so uh, most of the focus has been on the ready to sell on homes. Um, but as like a, an advisor to boards, I mean, to what extent are you telling the Kissingers and the Schultzes of the world to think twice about signing on to something that they don't you know, have any expertise in or maybe don't care what's going yeah. on in the company? I mean, well, you know, saying they don't care is, is a little aggressive. Um, but, but, you know, because now they certainly do care. Yeah. All right. <laughs> they, you certainly have their attention now. Um, and, you know, it, look, what the board that Elizabeth Holmes put together for this company is also probably unique or close to unique in Silicon Valley. Typically, your board is composed of sophisticated VCs and industry experts and company executives. It's a bunch of people who really know a lot about the market and have strong financial incentives to make sure that the company succeeds. Elizabeth got a board of directors of very prominent people, the vast majority of whom knew absolutely nothing uh, from their background about the drug testing market or what have you. Uh, you know, George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, you know, all right, Hen George Schultz, great American. All right, Henry Kissinger, we can have a conversation. <laughs> clearly, clearly big brand names designed to impress people. All right, look who I have on my board, all right, and look who you don't have on your board. All right, uh, and that was really part of the problem. This was not a board that was well structured to monitor the company or to assure that the company succeeded. It was a board designed to impress people at cocktail parties and that's not what boards of directors should be about. So following up on that, if she had had the right kind of board in place, how much of this disaster do you think would have been prevented? Right, you're provoking me to tell my story. All right, I'll tell my story. Just remember, you're on a hot mic. I'm on a hot mic. I am. <laughs> uh, so Elizabeth, I don't know whether I should be insulted or flattered, but Elizabeth Holmes asked me to be on her board. Ooh, all right. <laughs> Was I ever on her board? No. How did that happen? How did that happen? Um, I, I, first meeting, I, I, I am married probably to the smartest drug regulatory person in the United States. All right? So my wife has been in the drug regulatory business. And, and just through dinner table conversation, just through osmosis, all right, you know, I can talk FDA regulations as though I know what I'm talking about, okay? So I have my first meeting with Elizabeth, and I ask a bunch of questions, and Elizabeth doesn't give me any straight answers. So I go home, and I say, Carol, look, this is what's going on. Carol says, look, here are 10 questions you've got to ask, all right? And she tells me the questions. I write them down, and I said, look, I memorize them because I want to put them on my hand, look like Elizabeth Palin, you know, so here are the questions. So, so I go in, and I, I ask Elizabeth the first question, and, and, you know, her response reminds me a little bit of, like, 
you know, an overfed chicken flapping her wings trying to fly. This is, this is not going anywhere. Ask her the second question. And it's a little bit like I get a pantomime. I kind of go, what does that have to do with the question? Okay, I'll try it one more time, all right? And the third time, you know, again, total nonsense, totally non-responsive. I kind of go, this is awkward for you, Elizabeth. This is awkward for me. So, you know, how about those giants? Can you believe the bullpen? They blew it in the ninth inning. So we continue the conversation with how about those giants. And needless to say, she loses interest in my serving on her board. And I happen to lose interest in serving on her board. So it was a situation where what I would say is Elizabeth Holmes never lied to me, but she never answered a material question in a straight way. And if that's representative of the way she operated with sources of capital, I certainly understand why reputable venture capital firms didn't put their money in. And I'd really be interested in the thought process of a hedge fund that put $100 million into the operation without having straight answers to questions unless they were lied to, which is entirely plausible. I could see the VC, the, I see the hedge fund saying, hey, Chip Grinfest, we asked all the questions you did, but she didn't evade. She said, oh yeah, no, 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 we're close to an FDA approval. Oh yeah, 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 we've got all the data that we need in order to be able to publish. I could imagine her, I mean, it didn't happen to me, but I could imagine the complaint, and hopefully it'll be unsealed soon, making those direct allegations. So would that be, I mean, would you expect that ordinarily to occur on a board that has a lot of investor representation? Don't they have an interest in also in seeing the company's value go up and then maybe exit at, a, at the right time? In, look, this is so unusual. In Silicon Valley, if you had a company of this sort, all right, you, you would be doing the due diligence and the board would have on it venture capitalists with a lot of experience in the diagnostic space who know all about the CLIA regulations. Uh, every board, there'd be, you know, briefings on where's the science, uh, where do we stand with our publishable results, how are we interacting with the regulators. Uh, you know, I, I know how to run a board like that, which is why she wouldn't want me on her board. All right, we, we, would, we would not have gotten along for two seconds. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's another thing that's really interesting. It's a special case, but it's going to have larger implications for other companies in the question going back to the reliance clause, assuming there was one, assuming it's impossible, could the investors potentially still have a claim centered around breach of fiduciary duties? On fiduciary duties? Um, it's, it's really a, a case based on a breach of fiduciary duty is harder to win, right? Because there's generally something called the business judgment rule. And here, unless you're able to say that there was some sort of a self-interested transaction, uh, you wouldn't get out of the, the, the business judgment rule space. And typically in these, in these transactions, the board of directors isn't directly making any representations to the investors. So, you know, unless there are unusual circumstances here, You've got your highest level of exposure for Elizabeth Holmes and senior executives who may have made representations, uh, then the company. And if it's true that the board of directors just didn't have these facts, well, you know, uh, you, could, you could make out a claim for a breach of duty of loyalty and breach of duty of care, but it would be an uphill claim. All right? Again, the facts here are so unusual this may be the exception that proves the rule, but I'd, I'd be skeptical. Yes, sir. I have a sort of related question. What do you think is the likelihood that DOJ will go after individuals? And what kinds of things do they consider when they're making you know, that decision? You know, it's the question, what, what's the likelihood that the DOJ will go after individuals? Historically, there are many situations where the DOJ doesn't in the financial markets. But it's my impression that in healthcare-related investigations, the probability of going after an individual is much higher. And in this situation, if they can find circumstances where it's Ms. Holmes herself 
that may engage in a material misrepresentation or omission. And in order to establish criminal liability there, negligence is insufficient. You have to demonstrate that she did it willfully. That's the statutory language. Um, then you can send her to jail. Right? Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if the government's interested in demonstrating willful misrepresentations, uh, in part for very strong deterrence effect in this health care area. It seems like this is an issue that has come up over and over in the wake of the financial crisis and now yes. the Wells Fargo fiasco, yes. whether we should be thinking more and more about prosecuting executives. What are your own views about that? Oh, I don't think we prosecute executives often enough. I think, I think uh, um, if you really want to get deterrence, you need to have the individuals understand that they can't deflect responsibility onto the organization. Um, now, in large financial organizations, that's often extraordinarily difficult for a wide variety of reasons. And, you know, it's a separate session. You know, it's a separate two-hour conversation about why is it that essentially no senior executives of any financial institution have been criminally prosecuted. Forget about gone to jail. They haven't even been prosecuted for anything having to do with the financial crisis. Understanding the laws under which these people would have to be prosecuted, um, I get it. I understand why the Justice Department hasn't brought these cases. They would have lost these cases badly. Um, now, maybe that means that the laws should be changed. That's a separate conversation. But with the laws on the books, it would really be hard to get a criminal conviction of a senior executive at you know Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, City. Uh, the situation at Theranos is dramatically different because of the nature of the business, the nature of the information flows, the ability to prove the necessary elements of the call to action. Right? In other words, you can, you can get Elizabeth Holmes a hell of a lot more easily than you can get Lloyd Blankfein, and Lloyd would say he did nothing wrong, and he might actually have a very good point. Some Lloyd Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs. But that'll depend to some extent on what we learn about the specific allegations in the complaint, and specifically whether it's affirmative misrepresentations or just omissions, right? Because my understanding is a lot of the complaints about the company are that you didn't tell us things weren't going well, and your internal testing, you know, wasn't. Yeah. Were, were there a lot of? Is there a lot of documented well, affirmative misrepresentations? The other, the other stuff that I read is no uh, direct allegations of affirmative misrepresentations. You told us you were close to an FDA approval. You weren't. Yeah, close is in the eye. Close is the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Miss is as good as a mop. But that's going to be the litigation. Yeah, yeah that's going to be. And, and what else did you tell us? All right. You know, you, you told us you'd be publishing the results. You know, you told us X, Y, and Z. Um, remains to be seen. Was there some reason that uh, Lloyd Blank, buying under oath, could swear that there was no fiduciary responsibility? Is there some reason that. Uh, was there certain lobbying, or how come there was no fiduciary responsibility? For, for, for Lloyd Blankfein. Oh, L Lloyd Blankfein has a fiduciary responsibility, and, and he will argue, and he would probably prevail, that he satisfied his fiduciary responsibility. The big problem with, the with any criminal prosecution of the financial crisis is if you have a look at the behavior of all of these institutions, given reasonable expectations at that time, they have a good argument that it was not criminal and their behavior was reasonable because no, they will argue nobody saw the housing price collapse coming. And the probability of that housing price collapse was so low um, that you can't criticize us for not having run our business in anticipation that that could happen. And their defense in part would be pointing to the statistics generated by the Congressional Budget Office, the Federal Reserve, uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, none of whom warned about these possibilities. So their defense is, we were running a perfectly good and credible business on the assumption that the housing market wouldn't collapse, and we were entirely reasonable doing that, and you can't show us any data indicating that we should have been aware that the collapse was coming. He, he couldn't. 
be prosecuted for swearing under oath that he had no financial fiduciary responsibility. Uh, he did have a fiduciary responsibility. He didn't say he didn't. Well, isn't there a contradiction that has to be resolved there? I mean, he said it under oath, right? Well, actually, blank. Uh, 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 oh, oh, you're going to the congressional testimony with the uh, Golden Sachs. Uh, they were talking about their fiduciary obligations to their clients, all right? Uh, and the reality is Goldman Sachs has fiduciary obligations to some of its clients, but to the vast majority, but to a very large percentage of its clients, it has absolutely no fiduciary obligations whatsoever. And you're a client, and it's a client provider relationship, which is different from a fiduciary relationship. And people like to say that, well, if you're a client, then the broker's your fiduciary. And, and the answer is hell no. Um, and, and in litigation, plaintiffs are often very quickly schooled about that difference. We have time for one last question. This kind of wraps it up. But I guess, like, what is the take home or, like, what changes do you see happening from this? Like, is this just going to be, like, a cautionary tale, like, hey, if like all the big VCs aren't investing, maybe you should like figure out why. Um, or, or do you do you see like you obviously more, finished your sophomore year? <laughs> um, more far-reaching implications, like you said, with the um, SEC coming in and regulating things more in the valley, or I guess. No, let me let allow you. Yeah, no, I th I think you've I think you know you've nailed it. Uh, people now will have the courage of their convictions to say, look, I got some reasonable questions as part of my due diligence. Uh, I am not going to weaken my due diligence just because I'm chasing the hot deal. All right, uh, you you will hear the word Theranos mentioned at VC uh, you know uh, partners meetings more frequently. Uh, if companies are unhappy, if investors are unhappy with the answers that they're getting. Uh, and I think that's good. I think that's, that's all for the good. Uh, I think that the SEC's interest in the possibility of fraud will go up. Uh, the fact that we have multi-billion dollar valuations uh, in these situations, it's, it's, it's like catnip, all right, to the SEC. Uh, they'll feel there's, you can't have this much money flowing around and not need the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's almost an affront to their, their manhood. I mean, you know, my God, a market is really able to regulate itself in a constructive way and it doesn't need the heavy hand of the state to enforce? Well, till recently, pretty much. You know, and, and, and it, took a, it took a Stanford dropout to, to destroy that equilibrium, uh, but there you go. Well, in the interest of producing better Stanford products going forward, what advice do you have to folks in the audience who may one day be counsel in a startup and maybe have the experience of an executive not providing enough information or doing a lot of hand waving? There's a way to be a constructive skeptic, right? There's a way to work with a client and to sort of say, you know, you got to understand um, in the long run, the approach that you're taking is really not in your own best interest. But as I say that, there's certain types of personalities that when you try to counsel them that way, they'll basically flip you the finger, all right? And they'll say, wait a minute, I'm the CEO, you're working for me. Thank you very much for expressing that opinion. If you say that again, you're fired, all right? And you gotta learn how to navigate in these situations. There's some people that are just like that, and there are other people that will take mature advice. And, and, you know, what you'll learn when you get out in practice is very often you don't get to pick your clients. That's not a luxury uh, that people have in many situations. So sometimes you just have to learn how to deal in a professional and ethical manner with difficult, difficult people. All right. Thank you very much.